today. So our talk today will be Slimy, Sticky and Love Slugs in London. It will be by um, Imogen Cavadino, who's a friend of mine and a slug enthusiast. So Imogen is doing her PhD on slugs with the Royal Horticultural Society. And she's got a fantastic um, citizen science project about, um, about cellar slugs, which I'm sure she'll talk to you about. She is a fantastic advocate for slugs uh, and, and worked on them in the uh, National Museum of Wales over in Cardiff. I'm going to hand over to Imogen now. So without further ado, we'll start learning about why slugs are fantastic and we shouldn't be putting all these traps out in our gardens to, to stop them. Um, thing. For, for the record, by the way, Imogen, I planted broccoli that the slugs have destroyed, but I've just left it for them. I now see it as my, my slug habitat rather than, I don't really like broccoli anyway. My partner made, made me plant it. So they've done me a favour. They're not always bad. I like that idea. Sacrificial broccoli. <laughs> yeah, sacrificial broccoli. If they'd ate my carrots, I'd have been more upset. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, before I start sharing screen, I'm actually going to try a little experiment. I've not tried this with a talk with quite so many people before, but I'm actually going to put a link in the chat. And if you could click on that link, whichever device you're using, it should open a uh, idea boards in your browser. And this is simply where you can put a post-it note. You can add your own post-it note here. And I just want you to tell me what you know or think you know about slugs before the talk, which is on the left-hand side. And then at the end of the talk, we're going to come back to this and you can put stuff on the right hand side to tell me what you now know. Um, so, yeah, just have a play with that. I'll leave it open for you. Um, you can also upvote post-it notes so you can put a little plus on the left hand corner of one. Uh, thumbs up it so that um, you can agree with someone else's idea. So I'll leave that open. Um, feel free to play with that throughout the talk. Um, please keep it family friendly, of course. OK. So while you're all exploring that, I will share my screen. And make sure I've done that as well. Brilliant. Imogen, with the polls that we've got coming up, just let me know when you want them and I'll launch them for you. Fantastic, thank you. Great, so hopefully today, um, you're gonna learn a little bit about me and why I'm so passionate about slugs. Then we're gonna talk a bit about what makes a slug, why is a slug a slug, a lot about why slugs are really interesting and you should probably look at them a bit closer. I'm going to talk a bit about slugs in and around London and also how to get started with recording slugs. So hopefully you're already checking out the audio boards, putting some post-its on there, just letting me know what you already know about slugs. Um, that link is in the chat for you. So a bit about me, I first became interested in slugs relatively recently during my master's in conservation ecology and, and during this I had to do a, a module on taxonomy and identification so I had to pick any group to study for this and I thought well what group of animals do I think is absolutely disgusting and I should probably learn to appreciate a little bit more and I decided well slugs they're pretty gross and fortunately for me around that time a new guide to slugs had been published so I was able to pick that up and start reading and I just found it absolutely fascinating. Um, a chance email got me in touch with the author of that book and I then ended up doing a one-year traineeship with him at the National Museum of Wales in Cardiff, um, which was all focused around slugs, snails, freshwater snails and freshwater bivalves. Eventually that also led to what I'm currently doing now, which is a PhD on slug and snail diversity in gardens with the Royal Horticultural Society and Newcastle University. Um, so although my interest in slugs is relatively recent, it's also quite in depth and passionate. Um, and fairly recently, I also joined the Conchological Society have, as a member of their council, so I'm actually in charge of helping run the society as well. So I really love slugs. I'm here to get you all enthusiastic today, hopefully. So I'm just going to briefly mention part of my PhD. So it's all about understanding slug and snail diversity in UK gardens. I'm going to be talking about one of the research strands that I'm running today. So the first one is um, experiment I'm running is the RHS cellar slug survey. And this is one that everyone can get involved with. And I will be talking a lot more about this later on in the talk. 
The second one that I'm not really going to go into detail on today is the Slugs Count project. You may have noticed this being advertised in the BBC News last year. We actually have 60 dedicated volunteers who've been trained up going out into their gardens once every four weeks and recording what slugs they find there. This is a closed project, so um, only those 60 people can take part, but we're gathering a lot of data and a lot of information about slugs present around the UK. And I'm also doing some pest status and um, feeding choice experiments, so looking at um, what slugs do in the lab as well. Um, but like I said, we're only going to really be talking about the first strand of my research today. So first of all, what is a slug? Well, slugs belong to a phylum of invertebrates, so a group of invertebrates known as mollusca, which is one of the oldest groups of organisms um, still in on the planet. This includes other organisms like octopus, squid, clams, scallops, oysters, chitin, sea snails, sea slugs. They're all part of the same group known as the mollusca. What ties this entire group together is the presence of a fleshy flap of skin known as the mantle, which can look slightly different in different groups. Um, so for example, in the chitin, it's kind of this frilly skirt around the actual armor of the body there. And on the squid, it looks quite different again. They also tend to be tied together by that most of them have shells or remnant of a shell as well, but though there are some exceptions to this. Slugs and snails themselves belong to the class known as gastropoda within the mollusca. Gastro meaning stomach and poda meaning foot. This is all to do with the way that they appear to crawl around or wriggle around on their stomachs. So one of the questions I get asked a lot is how are slugs different to snails? Well, essentially they are part of the same group of animals and they are very similar in structure, um, but slugs actually evolved from snails. So first of all, snails evolved to live on the land. And then from that, uh, snails ha sorry, have shrunk and simplified their chorid shells, reducing them right down until they become a slug. This process has happened many different times independently, producing many different families of slug. So actually some slugs are more closely related to other snails than they are to other species of slug. So they have shrunk and simplified these shells right, right down, but they are usually still present in the body of a slug. It's just usually internal. So in many species, it's actually a fingernail like plate carried in the back of the mantle, mantle area, which on the back of a slug here is this fleshy bit at the front. And in fact, on this species of slug, slug present in Britain, you can just about see this white patch here. This is actually where the shell is showing through the very translucent skin. So you can actually kind of make out the shape of the shell there. In other species of slug, the shell has been reduced right, right down. So it's more like a granular powder. So there's really not much of it left. Slugs only make up about a third of all the terrestrial monarch species in Britain. So actually all the rest are snails. So there's a lot more snails than there are slugs, um, but generally most snail species that we see um, are quite some of the big ones and there's a lot and a lot of tiny, tiny ones out there. But today I'm mainly gonna be talking about slugs because although they are the same group, they're often treated quite differently. So the biggest threat to any slug or a snail is actually just drying out. The shells can provide a lot of protection for snails, so it actually prevents a lot of water loss through evaporation. And they can also actually, in some cases, produce a protective layer over the mouth of the shell in really tough environmental conditions. So if it's really hot and dry or it's really, really cold time of year, they can create this protective layer, which will help protect them during the these challenging times. So slugs are actually much more vulnerable in a way to drying out, but they have the advantage of having lost those big heavy shells. They can actually crawl down into the soil, hide in cracks or under the soil and actually stay really nice and moist down there. In fact, some species during winter, they'll actually create these mucus lined cells within the soil itself um, to waste out harsh conditions. So things like too cold temperatures or not enough moisture in the air. They can respond really quickly to environmental conditions like rain, so they can disappear during drought periods and kind of rest under the soil, not doing a lot. And then as soon as it rains and it becomes wet outside again, they can actually re-emerge and be active. The same is true of temperature as well. So generally any temperature below five degrees Celsius is when slugs tend to be inactive and you don't really see many around. So this time of year, it's a lot harder to find slugs, even though they are still out there, they're actually just hiding because their temperatures are so cold. And this slime actually provides a huge amount of protection. In some cases, it actually allows them to crawl over razor blades and that kind of thing because they're so well protected from the surface they're crawling over. In fact, generally when a slug or snail is crawling, they're actually just crawling over 
a, a layer of mucus that they've laid down so they're not in indirect contact with the skin on the surface of the object. Slugs are quite interesting in that, that they produce at least two different types of movement, uh, mucus. One for mucus, uh, sorry, one for movement and the other one for defence. Generally, the movement slime tends to be clear in most species and a little bit sticky. But in some cases, um, they produce quite a different defensive slime. So, for example, this slug at the bottom here, known as the dusky slug or Arian subfuscus, when you rub the body sides of this slug, it produces this really bright orange, slightly silky mucus that you can actually rub into your fingers, but when you do that, it stains it a bright orange. This is really distinctive, so actually when you come across this slug, it's often used as an ID character because it, it produces such a distinctive slime. And there's some other species out there that produce distinctive slime as well. So actually rubbing your slug and seeing what colour the slime is can be a really useful way of looking at your slugs. So it's not easy being a slug, first of all, because you're trying not desperately not to dry out because your body is made from about 80 to 90 percent water. Then you've also got the challenge of that absolutely everything out there pretty much wants to eat you. So a long time ago, I kind of trowed through all, all the scientific literature I could and just picked out any references of animals that fed on slugs or snails. Um, and this is kind of just a few that I managed to find. There's a huge amount of amphibians and reptiles that will feed on slugs and snails, also various birds and a lot of mammal species as well. Not just the classic hedgehog that everyone thinks of, but also things like badgers and foxes will use slugs and snails to supplement their diet. There's also a lot of specialist invertebrates that feed on slugs and snails, including some other snails. So for example, in this photo at the top here, the smaller species of snail is actually feeding on the larger one. You've also got a whole group of flies that specialise in killing uh, snails as well. And there's even one species that will feed on slugs too. As well as various mites that are dependent on slugs or snails for survival. Also some classic invertebrates, so things like ground beetles, they'll feed on a lot of slugs and snails, many species of ground beetle will. And of course, the glowworm. The larvae of the glowworm is completely dependent on a diet diet of snails, um, which it relies on to basically complete its life cycle and to feed. So a really important food source for a lot of animals and also a good dietary supplement for many others as well. But it's still not easy being a slug because not only does everyone want to eat you, you're at risk of drying out, but you'll also be accused of the humans of things that you didn't do. So most people see a slug and they assume the worst and they panic and say, oh no, that slug is going to eat all my plants. Um, so I've just picked up this example from a website. I've intentionally not named which website because I thought I was a bit, a bit too mean. And this website is a gardening one and it says these are the most harmful slugs in your garden. So we have at the top left here, we have Arian hortensis, which is the blue black soil slug. This will feed on plant material, including potatoes. So it can be a bit of a pain. On the right hand side at the top here, you have Duroceros reticulatum, the netted field slug. This is a major plant pest in agricultural settings. It can reproduce in large numbers and cause a lot of crop damage. So it's fair enough to say it probably would cause damage in gardens as well. And at the bottom here, you have Limicus maculatus, the green cellar slug, um, which is actually not very kind to say it's a harmful slug at all because this one actually feeds on rotting plant material, fungi, lichens and algae. It will very occasionally attack some very tender plants, um, but most of the time it's completely harmless to our garden plants. And this goes, just goes to show how misunderstood slugs can be and widely kind of mis misrepresented. So slug diets are actually really complicated. So we know a bit about the diets of at least 42 species in Britain and Ireland. At least 28% of slug species established in Britain and Ireland are actually omnivorous, meaning that they'll eat absolutely anything. They're very opportunistic, so they'll feed on things like plant material, um, dead and decaying animals, animal waste, fungi, lichen, algae. In some cases, they've also been known to feed on live animals, so um, occasionally there's been records, very rarely, of slugs actually feeding on bird nestlings. So they really are opportunistic, some of these species, which can be a good thing, but it can also be a, not a great thing, obviously. About 17% of species are fungivorous, meaning that they only feed on things like fungi, lichens and algae. So these, this group would not attack any plants that we're particularly fond of, unless, of course, you're mycologist. In that case, I apologise for that. 
12% will be Kieran's least favourite group because these are the carnivorous slugs that feed on earthworms. So these exclusively have a diet of earthworms. They're actually one of our most primitive group of slugs. They have a really slow meta metabolic rate. So they probably only feed on about one earthworm a week maximum. So very slow digestive process. And they're also really weird looking animals. Um, hopefully I'll talk a little bit more about those later on. We've got 26% then. These tend to be the gardener's enemy because these are the herbivores. So they'll feed on plant material. However, within this group, there's a kind of fuzzy divide between those that maybe feed only on live plant material and those that feed on dead plant material and those that probably feed on both. And there's a lot that needs to be discovered about these still. And then a whole 17% of species, we just don't know enough about them to actually know what their diets are. So it's a lot, a lot more complicated than just, you know, all slugs will attack my plants. So I do have a poll for you now. So I just want you to tell me if it's true or false that slugs and snail have teeth. So I'll give you 20 seconds on this. I'll point out that the poll is anonymous. So even if you're not sure, you can still vote and nobody will know what you put. Yeah, no judgment here. Okay. Brilliant. So most people got it that correct. It is true. Slugs and snails do indeed have teeth. In fact, they have thousands of them. So in the UK, this ranges between about 2,000 teeth to 7,000 teeth, depending on the species of slug. So these teeth are actually adapted depending on the diet as well. So on the left here, we have a species that feeds mainly on rotting plant material or fungi, lichens and algae. So these have actually two different types of teeth. You can see they've got really close together rows. Um, you've got kind of pointy ones here and then you've got slightly more curved ones on the edge here. So a little bit like our molars and incisors. And this is probably to do with the fact that they feed on plant material that they'll scrape off hard surfaces as well. So they kind of need sharp teeth to help chew it up, but also scrape material off hard surfaces. Then on the right hand side, you've got one of the carnivorous species of slug here. So this one feeds on earthworms. You can see it's got a very different teeth arrangement. The teeth are actually more in spaced out rows, kind of in a chevron pattern with this big channel down the middle. And this will be re reflecting the way that they actually feed on the worms. So they kind of suck it in down the central channel and use the side teeth to kind of grind it up a bit. So thousands and thousands of teeth. The way slugs and snails feed is also quite interesting. So all of those thousands of teeth are on a process known as the radula. This sits inside the slug or snail's mouth, a lot like a tongue, but covered in thousands of teeth. So it's just this diagram on the left gives you a quick idea of how this works. So the, your slug or snail will actually use this whole group of muscles to push the radula outside of the mouth, scrape it along whatever it's feeding and pull the material back into its mouth. So really interesting. And actually when you're watching them feed, you can kind of almost see this action happening in many species. What I also find fascinating about slugs, and I feel like I have to mention this, is that they have amazing sex lives. So all slugs in Britain are hermaphroditic, meaning that they're both male and female at the same time. So finding a partner to reproduce with is fairly straightforward. You just need to find another member of your species. And in some cases, they don't even worry about that. They'll just find a, a member of a close related species, which creates a bit of a taxonomic mess for us. Mating habits do tend to vary a lot between different species groups and, and different species themselves as well. And courtship can be really complicated. So for example, this slug at the top left here, this is the netted field slug, Dorosaurus reticulatum that we talked about earlier. These actually have quite a complicated courtship behavior. So this one is showing this quite nicely. It's got this little process sticking outside of its head and it's actually stroking the back of its partner. <laughs> It's thought that they actually do this to transfer, uh, transfer hormones to their partner and try and entice them into mating and also in increase reproductive success. In this species in particular, this can go on for quite a while. They stroke each other and if their partner reciprocates, they'll 
mutually stroke each other. They'll actually circle each other as they're doing that. And then at some point, I don't know why, they'll actually start biting each other's tails, thrashing their tails around and smacking each other in the face. This will then go on for a little bit longer and then they'll go back to gently stroking and this cycle will continue and it can continue for about half an hour to an hour. We honestly don't really understand why it's so complicated, but this is how they prefer to reproduce. Then you have classic things like the leopard slug. This has even been covered by David Attenborough because it's quite a fantastic display. Very different, they'll find a high object, create this long mucus rope, twine their bodies around each other, avert the genitalia, and mating will happen like that. And a lot of the time they'll actually be spinning as well as they're doing so. Once mating's finished, often they'll drop to the floor or in some cases they'll even crawl back up and eat the mucus rope as they go. In other groups, it's a little bit less exciting. They'll actually just follow each other for a while and then they'll circle each other, form this ball, stick the genitalia in the middle and reproduce that way and kind of head off quite quickly. So it's quite a brief affair. But I think it's one of the fascinating things about slugs is just all this mating behavior, which is so unusual. However, it's not just that that's interesting. Um, some slugs also exhibit quite an unusual behavior. So you might have seen these really big bulky slugs around and about outside in your gardens, in the streets. Um, these are quite unusual for a slug in a way in that they're quite tolerant of daylight conditions. So they'll actually crawl around on pavements and things like that throughout the day. What's interesting with these species is, although they look really elongated when they're crawling, when you actually poke them or just surprise them, they will, they'll contract into a hump. And if you gently kind of press on the head end or along the body, sometimes you can get them contract and they'll do this special little dance. So you can see the slug is kind of rocking its body from side to side. This is a really useful behavior for us because there's actually five different species of these slugs that look very similar and they can all hybridize as well, which creates this very complicated mess but only a few of them will do this rocking behavior. So if you can actually get them to do this, it's a really useful field character, um, not only because it looks quite interesting and is quite cool, but also it helps you to identify it to species. We actually don't know why they do this behavior. The only theory we have is that somehow it's a defense against predators, but if I was something wanting to eat this slug, I don't think I'd really be that put off by it gently rocking its body. Okay, so how many species of slug do you think are found in Britain and Ireland? Um, Kieran, could you launch the next poll, please? Thank you. I did give a, a little slip away earlier. You might have caught it. We'll give another five seconds. So quickly vote. Remember it's anonymous. There's no judgment. All right, okay. Let's see what people have said. Oh, interesting. So yes, we've got 5% for 20, 36% 40, 43% 60, and 15% 100. Um, so actually there is about 44 species of slug found in Britain Island. So anyone who said 40, you were probably the closest there. The reason why we're always a little bit vague and we say there's about is because there's a lot of taxonomic dispute around some species. Some have only been recognized as being separate species fairly recently through genetic means. So they actually haven't fully been described yet. So you'll actually see the number changes quite a lot because we haven't decided completely as taxonomists how many there are, but also we're getting more and more species arrive and being discovered constantly as well. So that number is constantly changing. Only one of those is actually protected under law. And I'll actually mention this one later on for conservation reasons. And this is one of the exciting things about studying slugs is the species fauna is completely changing all the time. So when they created this new identification guide to slugs in 2014, absolutely fantastic book, by the way, they actually went out and they sampled all across Britain and they discovered all the slugs they could possibly find and Ireland as well, get examples of those, not only to take wonderful photos, um, to look at the morphology, but also they actually took genetic material as well. And they actually discovered that there's more than 20% more species present and established in Britain than we'd realized. 
What's quite interesting in, in this particularly as well is less than half the slug fauna is considered native to Britain. So slugs are kind of very influenced by human activity in a way. A lot of species seem to arrive through human means, um, whether intentional or not. And many of these are actually arriving still, and some are even changing range within Britain. So we've had some species arrive in the 1950s, limited to greenhouses for quite a while, and then suddenly move out into the open area as well with climate change happening. So there's a lot of dyna dynamic things happening, and there's lots of slugs changing range and new species arriving all the time. Part of the challenge of this is that very little is known about many of these new species. Some have actually been described from Britain as brand new to science, but we've quickly realised or discovered that they're not native to Britain themselves. They're actually native to a different part of the world, but the, the part of the world they're from hasn't actually studied them either. So we know very little about them. So a really exciting group to work on. So this is actually from this that book, and this is um, an overview of the entire British slug fauna. There are a couple of species discovered since that are not in this guide, but there's only a few, mind you. Um, but it's just a really nice example of what all our slug species look like. And you can see there's some very similar looking ones and there's also some very different looking ones. What an interesting group to also look out for is this little group at the bottom here of four slugs. These are known as the shelled slugs because they actually have evolved slightly differently so that this, the shell is no longer um, inside the body, but it's actually outside the body on the tip of the tail. So they're quite unique in a way for this group. We also have this tiny group down here that look a bit like snails. These are actually known as the semi-slugs. So they get the honour of being both considered slugs and snails because they have this coiled shell still, but they're unable to pull their bodies fully into it. So they actually get included in both ID guides at times. And we've still got new discoveries, of course, being made. So since that guide was produced um, in 2016, I believe it was, they actually discovered a new species of semi-slug established in Britain. Um, so this is actually thought to have come in through planting of trees. So it was found in some forestry plantation in um, parts of Southeast Wales. And they discovered that there was actually quite a large population of these um, that they thought came in with the trees when they were planted. It doesn't seem to be able to spread too far, thankfully, because it is a predatory species. So there's potential risk, maybe to our native fauna as well, if they do feed on native invertebrates. Um, but the person who discovered them did go back this year and discovered that the population is still going well as well. So they're obviously here to stay. So there are some slugs as well that are of conservation interest. So I'm just going to mention a couple of these. So for example, the lemon slug at the top left here, this is beautiful little yellow slug. This is actually an ancient woodland specialist. So they actually feed only on fungi that are associated with ancient trees. So they tend to be restricted to ancient woodland habitat for that reason. They're really elusive little slug. We only ever really see them during the autumn and winter months when they come up to feed on the fungal fruiting bodies. So the fungi comes up out of the forest floor and the slugs come up as well to feed on them. The rest of the time of year, they're very rarely or if ever found. Um, we think that they spend the rest of their life cycle underground, feeding maybe on the hyphae or the roots of the fungi. So very much dependent on ancient woodland. They don't seem to be able to survive in areas where ancient woodland is removed. The ash black slug at the bottom here is actually Europe's largest slug species. So it reaches quite a big length in some cases. Um, 30 centimetres is the longest record, um, though we do think that was a bit of an extremely giant one and it's probably a bit rare for them to get that big. Again, this is quite restricted to ancient woodland where it seems to feed mostly on lichens and algae, a bit more than fungi. Um, but it does seem a bit more tolerant, so it can actually survive in areas where ancient woodland has been removed. So it is able to actually survive in areas like that. Then on the right hand side, we have our only protected species of slug, which is protected both under European and local laws. This is only found on the Isle of Ireland. It's not actually found in mainland Britain, so we're never going to find this in London, unfortunately. Um, but it's quite unusual as well because it specialises in acidic habitats um, where it tends to be more found. And there's a lot of interesting research done on this species because of its protected status in Ireland. So really interesting species to look at. So I do have a video I'm going to try and share with you now. Um, I'm aware my internet might be a little bit sketchy, but we'll sorry, try and see if we can get this working. Okay. <laughs> Oh, 
There are over 44 species of slugs present in Britain and Ireland, and many of these found in gardens. While some species can cause damage to plants, many may also play beneficial roles in the garden, so knowing what species you have found can be helpful in understanding if these are potential friends or foes. In this video, we're going to talk about what features to look at on a slug to try and identify it to species level. Most slugs have a similar body shape with a saddle-shaped fleshy area just behind the head called the mantle and a long tail section. Look at the mantle area to see whether there are any patterns like spots or stripes. Are the patterns regular or irregular? What colour is the rest of the body, particularly the tail area? Are there any markings on the body? What colour are they? Are they regular stripes, irregular blotches or spots? Or are the markings only between the body texture? Does the edge of the foot have a different colour? What colour is the sole of the foot? Is it all one colour or are parts of the sole a different colour? On the front of their heads, they have two sets of sensory tentacles. The top set usually contain the eyes. The colour of these tentacles can sometimes be helpful in species identification. The colour of slime that slugs produce can also be useful in identifying them to species. However, keep in mind that species can produce at least two different types of slime, one for everyday movement and one for defence. Often these are different in colour and texture. You can observe this by placing the slug on a piece of paper to see the mucus produced when they crawl. Gently rubbing the body sides with fingers or with a white tissue can reveal the colour of defensive slime. Not all slug species can be identified from photographs. Some species require dissection and examination of the gelatalia to be able to identify them to species level. However, this usually applies to a few groups of species. If you are submitting records of slugs or asking for help with identification, it's essential to provide photographs for a second opinion. It is important to take photographs with multiple views of each slug you want identified, so that any characteristics important for that group or species is captured. These views should include a side view showing the right-hand side of the slug with the breathing pore visible, a top-down view showing the top of the slug, a view showing the sole of the foot. It is best to take these pictures of the slug while it is actively crawling so that all the colours and patterns are visible. Placing the slug on a sheet of glass or plastic and gently turning it over is one way of getting a good photo of the sole of the foot. Gently rolling the slug over is another simple way to get this image while outside. Okay, so I will share the look of that in the chat um, during the question section. So you can open it and save it and watch it again later if you prefer to. Oh, sorry, my laptop is just crushed. Oh no. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see my screen again. So yes, if that was a bit juddery, I do apologise. Um, like I said, I will share the link in the chat later so you can watch it back at, at your leisure after the call. So the key points to kind of take away from that, in case you didn't catch them, is that the slugs, most slugs are right-hand sided. So the breathing pore is always on the right-hand side. Sometimes in very, very rare genetic cases, you will find a left-handed sided, left sided slug where the, gen, uh, the breathing pore is on the left. In that case, get very excited, take lots of pictures, we'll be keen to hear about it. So usually it's very important to get a photograph of the right-hand side because often where lines run around the breathing pore is quite an important character. Slugs can be quite difficult to identify from photographs, which is why it's so important to have those multiple views. So if you are taking photos of slugs, try and get a side view, top down view and a view of the underside if you can, because we use a lot of body colour and pattern to actually identify slugs. The slime colour can also be useful as well. So it's often worth making note of that if you are trying to record slugs. So as mentioned in the video, you've got the mantle area here at the front of the slug. This is what connects it to all the other groups um, within the mollusca as well as its internal shell in this case. And then you've got breathing pore on the right, 
Eye tentacles, the color of these can also be quite useful. And then you have the long tail section with often this raised ridge known as the keel. So that's quite important as well to make a note of that if you see it. And sometimes this can be different colors as well. So now we've talked a little bit about how to identify some slugs. Um, I want to talk a bit about my research and some slugs that are quite easy to identify and that I need your help with. So these are the cellar slugs. There's two species, the yellow cellar slug, Limicus flavus, and the green cellar slug, Limicus maculatus. So Limicus flavus was considered to be a native, well, an endemic species or possibly a, the, the there's a bit of debate around that as to whether it's native or not, but it's been here for a long, long time, at least since the 1600s, maybe earlier. Um, but what's interesting about it is it was considered a really widespread species, very strongly associated with human habitation, is often found around houses and in gardens. However, in the 1960s, um, some people studying slugs suddenly noticed that actually they weren't finding as many lemon, uh, yellow cellar slugs anymore. And they discovered that a new species had arrived from the Isle of Ireland, the green cellar slug, Limicus maculatus, which kind of looks quite similar. Um, and it has very similar habits as well. It, it inhabits often the same habitat. Um, so it's very strongly associated with humans again. However, it seems to be a little bit more adapted to our climate. It seems to also be able to inhabit areas that aren't closely associated with humans. So things like woodland as well. And over time, we slugs seems to be declining quite sharply. In fact, when they did that ID guide in 2014, they could only find reliable representatives of the species from parts of Southeast Wales and parts of Devon and Cornwall as well. So really reduced range when you look at this distribution map containing all the historic records. Um, so it was really interesting to, to come across this and I thought, well, this is a great slug to talk to people about. First of all, because we can answer this scientific question of where is this slug now? Has it caused a decline in the native species potentially? But also they're really good slugs to talk to gardeners about because these slugs do not feed on live plant material. They only really feed on decaying plants and also things like fungi, lichens and algae. So they're probably quite important in helping break material down. It's quite common to find them around places like compost bins in particular. So one of the challenges we seem to have is um, that these two species might also be able to hybridize. And one of the theories is that the green cellar slug is actually better at reproducing um, and outcompetes the yellow cellar slug, but also is more genetically dominant. So when they do hybridize, um, all the offspring will be green cellar slugs and not yellow cellar slugs. So we launched this survey in March 2019 in collaboration with iRecord. So we have a specialised form on iRecord for this information and that allows me to ask lots of questions about the gardens that they're found in. We are particularly interested in garden records at this point but if you do have other records as well please do pop them on iRecord because I'm sure I'll be looking at those as well as part of my research. So if you just go to the RHS website, which is rhs.org.uk forward slash slug survey, there's all the information about my particular survey on there as well as the links to the iRecord form as well. We also have a handy little ID guide that's freely downloadable from the website as well, which just highlights the difference between these two species. So although they are very similar looking, they both have these greeny yellow mottled, mottled bodies, which can be very similar in colour, so don't let the difference in yellow and green for you. Um, it's actually this unbroken yellow line along the centre of the tail here, which is a key character for the yellow cellar slug. So you do need to look out for this unbroken yellow line. They also do have a slightly finer body texture as well, but this is really hard to spot um, for people starting out with slug ID. So mainly look for this unbroken yellow line. Confusingly, sometimes the yellow, uh, sorry, the green cellar slug can also have blotchy patterns that sometimes join together to form sort of a bit of a line so it can be a bit tricky which is why it's always so important to have these lovely photos of the top down view so that we can actually try and ID these slugs. For this, these particular species the top down view is enough. Now at the bottom here we've also included the leopard slug in the survey simply because when we're talking to people about cellar slugs they're often like oh I have seen that slug I just thought it was a green leopard slug. So some people hadn't even realised that they were separate species they were actually seeing so we decided to try and include the three species as well so that we can get some more records of the leopard slug too because it's quite a nice slug to have records of. 
So historically, the yellow cellar slug has been quite widely recorded in London. So there's actually quite a lot of records on there. Um, unfortunately, MBM was not playing ball when I tried to look at the data in more detail. So I can't actually tell you what years the different points are from. But I suspect that a lot of these are probably older records. However, I do know for a fact that we have had some recent records come in as I record on I record that are correct. So there are still some strongholds of um, yellow cellar slugs around in London. But you can also see there's a lot of green dots arriving on this map as well from where the green cellar slug appears to have taken over potentially. And although I'm talking about conflict, actually these two slugs will often huddle together. Um, so they will be found sometimes in the same location within the same garden as well. So it's well worth looking at all the slugs, green spotty slugs you find to see which ones you have. So what about other slugs in London? Well, I couldn't talk about slugs in London and not share this beautiful picture of the Tate Britain from two years ago where they decided to cover the whole museum in some amazing big leopard slugs. Absolutely wonderful. So London's actually been a bit of a slug hotspot for many, many years. There's been some really interesting slug stuff happening. So one example of this is the orange shelled slug. So this is one of those shelled slug species I mentioned earlier. They've reduced their shell to the tip of the tail here and they live underground and feed on earthworms. So they're relatively rarely encountered. This is actually first described to, um, to science from a garden in Lambeth in 1821. But what's interesting about this is it's one of those classic examples where it's described in Britain, but actually it's probably a Mediterranean import. So it probably somehow got here from the Mediterranean. It's not considered to be native. And actually in 2014, through the genetic research they did, they discovered that there is a genetically distinct species hiding within the species. And actually the genetically distinct one is considered to be the more widespread species of the two. So very complicated story happening here and all started in London. And I really can't talk about slugs in London and not mention Stella Davies, who's just an incredible naturalist and an internationally renowned slug specialist, um, who was actually based in Croydon and Sandersted for, for some of her life, but also did spend time in Cambridge, working at the Natural History Museum there and the Natural History Museum in London as well, and also some time in New Yorkshire. She did some amazing work. She carefully observed all the slugs in her garden over many years and led to discovery of many new species of slug. She was way ahead of her time actually, so she did a lot of breeding experiments and hypothesised that actually through these experiments there were several different species hiding within the garden that were being recorded at the time as just one species. Over the many decades they've actually evidenced this through DNA analysis and further morphological analysis as well and discovered that a lot of her hypotheses were correct. So she's actually attributed as discovering a lot of new species to Britain and some new species to science as well. There's one, um, one of those big large chunky slugs that we were talking about earlier that dance. There's one of those that actually hasn't been fully described yet but has been attributed to her name because of the research she did. Really fascinating woman. There's a brilliant obituary on the internet out there about her um, and really fascinating her the life she's led and the amount of slug science she did. Um, unfortunately she wasn't massively into publishing so um, there's a lot of unpublished work I suspect out there from her. Another slug to look out for which has not yet arrived in London but it's probably on its way is actually the ghost slug. This is quite an amazing slug again. Um, it was brand new to science in early 2000s and in 10 time. And it's actually one of the few organisms that's not Welsh, but the second part, Asprida, is actually derived from the Welsh for spirit or ghost. And this is probably reflecting its white coloration and the fact that again, it lives underground and is quite rarely encountered. It's not yet been recorded in London, but we have had records from Welwyn Garden City and also from Oxfordshire and other parts of the UK. It has started cropping up in odd bits of the country as well. So it's well worth looking out for this slug as well. But it's worth remembering that not every white slug you see will be a ghost slug. So National Museum Wales created this lovely little guide for this species. So the ghost slug is really weird for a slug in that it's evolved completely separately from other slugs again. So it actually doesn't have a shell at all. So it looks a bit like a shelled slug in its body form because it's evolved so it doesn't have this fleshy flap known as the mantle at the front here. Instead it's been reduced to the small area at the back and actually it breathes through the 
back of its body here. Whereas on most typical slugs, they have this fleshy mantle at the front and the breathing hole on the right hand side next to the head. So it's always worth looking at white slugs and looking at these key body structures to be able to know whether you have a ghost slug or one of the other species of slug in a white form or white colour. So I'm going to quickly talk about slug recording. So hopefully you're all feeling excited about slugs and you're keen to get out there and actually start recording slugs. So the London Natural History Society, despite Kieran's best efforts, does not currently have a mod slug recorder. Um, so there is no one out there to actually identify them. You could also send your, your records to the local record centre, of course, but I actually don't know if Giggle has anyone checking the mollusk records on there. So actually my preferred method would be to put your records on iRecord. And in fact, you could even use the London Natural History activity on there and put your mollusk records through that. The amazing benefit of iRecord is actually all the records are checked by volunteer expert verifiers on there. So um, I do some of those, but Chris here does a lot of them. So you'll probably hear from Chris before if you do put any mollusk records on there, as he verifies a lot of the slug ones in particular. So there are active recorders on there checking them. Also, any unusual records then go again to the National Recorder of Nummery Mollusks, which is Ben Rosen, the author of the Slug Guide and my mentor as well. And so he'll actually check all the really interesting records particularly. And he represents the Conchological Society who have one of the longest running data sets of Nummery Mollusks in Britain. They'll actually harvest all this data from iRecord of these Nummery Mollusks. Just double check it all again, make sure everything looks good and actually upload all this information onto the MBN Atlas. This happens once a year, so the records are updated every year. These are then freely available to the public, researchers, local record centres for download, so anyone can then access that data directly from there. But maybe you're not feeling confident about your slug ID. There are some places you can go for some help. So you could go straight to the memory marine record Ben. You can actually email him via the Conch Shock website and ask for some ID help with particular species. We do have a Facebook group as well that's very active, the Land and Freshwater Mollusca of Britain and Europe. So you can go on here and post pictures and ask for opinions on things. And of course, you're always welcome to reach out to me. I do have my email address on here, but also my Twitter account as well. Um, I'm not always the best at responding to emails, so it's usually quicker to tweet at me if you are a Twitter user to get me to look at something. So lots of help out there for you as well. But of course, it would be brilliant if you could all go out I'm and get started looking for this iconic species. Yeah. Um, so get out there looking for the yellow cellar slug or the green cellar slug. We're interested in finding both species. So even if you find one and not the other, please do let us know. Also the leopard slug as well. We're always keen to hear where that is too. Okay, so now what I'd like you to do is go back to that that board that I shared the link to at the beginning and tell me a bit about what you know about slugs now. Imogen, can you re-share that? that link? I just Is that want to say okay? thank you to everyone for listening today and also for that support me to doing tours like this. Yep, of course, I'll just exit full screen and get that for you. Sorry, I would have done it myself. I just realized I got kicked out <laughs> of the meeting partway through, so I've lost all that part of the chat. Okay, I'll pop it in there now. Right, so while people are Sorry. doing that well, please feel free to turn your videos back on. Um, and Imogen, at, at this point, are you ready for questions as well? While people are filling in the board? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So we haven't got a lot of time. I'm going to go over a little bit because I did run over a little bit and I took some time out of this. So we'll go to about 10 past eight. That's fine. Um, while uh, everybody's getting used to the board, if anybody's got a question, please raise your hand. Um, and while we're waiting for that, um, oh, Kat, I see you've got your hand raised. Yep. I meant your virtual hand, but I saw your physical Yeah, I, I know, but I can't find it. <laughs> my, my virtual hand saying, um, do you know, uh, when I, uh, whenever I look closely at slugs, they have little <coughs> tiny mites on them. Um, crawling, sliding, swimming, whatever they do. Um, do you know what they are? And are they harmful to the slug or cleaning it up or whatever? That's a great question. I did actually have a slide in my presentation at one point about that, but I realised it's <laughs> getting way too long, so I cut that out. Um, sorry, I have my video off because my internet connection is a bit shaky. Um, so 
These are actually specialist mites that specialize in slugs and snails. So there's thought to be about two species of mite. Originally, it was stated that one specializes in slugs and one specializes in snails. But recently, there's been a lot of taxonomic debate around these mites. So they think there could be more than one species or two species even, and that they might not be quite so evenly distributed as they thought. Um, so originally when naturalists saw these, they actually assumed that the mites were just hitting a lift, but actually they've now realized that they, they feed on the slug. It's all frozen. They seem to have a huge impact on the slug or snail, so it's not really worth taking them off because they don't seem to be harmed by yeah. them at all. Yeah. It's just something that, that is there and something that's evolve alongside them yeah Imogen you might be right your signal might be a little bit bad so it might be worth turning off the mm -hmm. video sorry for that mm -hmm. um, can you hear me Imogen hello Imogen I think she's just disappeared from the call, so that could make it difficult to answer slug questions. Um, okay. She might she might reappear in a minute. Um, we'll give her we'll give her a minute just to yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, uh. <laughs> yeah, this gives everybody plenty of opportunity to fill in um, the ideas board, which I think is a fantastic idea in itself. Um, yeah, we'll just wait for Imogen to hopefully try and return. Um, in the meantime, if people have got any questions, drop them in the chat. I know that... Um, We've got plenty. We'll, we'll certainly keep her busy when she gets back. Um, yeah, if, she, if she manages to make it back. Have we got any very generic ones? Because I can have a go at um, very generic. I, I was just looking for some very generic... Not. Um, well, there's one that, that someone we've got a spider expert in the call. So somebody, David Will has asked, um, there's some spiders in Falcus, Falcus genus that feed on snails. Are there records of spider predation on slugs? I'm sure Edward was on the call before. So I'd be surprised if there aren't spiders that feed on slugs because spiders are pretty pretty aggressive little animals aren't they they like to eat whatever whatever they can and there's usually a spider specialist for everything um, I, I can hear that but I, for some reason or other i can't seem to get my picture up um, no, we can hear you we can hear you though okay um i i didn't know about that actually i think i've heard uh, a focus is the daddy long leg spider or the common daddy long leg spider um i didn't know it, they, they fed on slugs but um I suppose that's that's uh, quite possible. I would have thought that something like Tegenaria or Amarobius, the larger spiders, would. Um, hold on, I start my video. Here we are. Um, okay. um, quite possibly would would um, would feed on slugs, but I've never mm. observed it myself, and I can't honestly, uh, I can't give you any more better answer than that. Sorry. Thanks, Edward. Victoria's put a comment in the chat with a link to a. A review of spider and harvestman predators on slugs and snails. It's amazing what gets published. Oh, um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a link in the... Can you see the chat, Edward? Yeah. If not, I'll send it to you afterwards. There's a oh, link okay, there. Yeah. So. yeah. I think we've got Imogen Imogen's returning come, now. Yeah. She's just coming back in. Uh, if you unmute, Imogen. Sorry about that. My computer completely kicked me out of the meeting. I don't know what happened. It did it to me earlier as well. I understand. <laughs> Um, yeah, your signal is a bit jittery, so if you do want to stop your video, to, that's fine. Right, Sue, you've been patiently waiting with your hand up. What is your question? It might be generic, but my question is, do they prefer to be one sex or the other when they're mating, or do they do both, or does it vary through species? Is it better to be for them to be male so that they don't put as much energy into sperm rather than eggs? Okay, so Imogen, yeah. That is a great thing? question. Go on, carry on, sorry. So, so um, generally they prefer to behave simultaneously. So most species will actually be both male and female during mating. But there are some 
kind of elements of sexual warfare going on within some species to try and overcome this because slugs are interesting in that they can actually store sperm in part of the genitalia um, known as the bursa duct and they can store it there and either use it later or they can actually digest it to get the nutrients back from the package of sperm and digest it that way so in the meantime they've kind of the male side of them has developed defenses against that so in some species they actually have something known as the spermatophore which is this kind of really elaborate corkscrew like process very spiky looking um, that they actually put the package of sperm inside and put inside the partner and this is just to stop the sperm from being digested so there's a lot going on there um, but it's only some species that do that so there's a lot of warfare going on so they have all these defenses to try and you know be the male and to try and make sure that they don't have to fertilize their eggs if they don't want to. Um, but generally it's thought that they tend to play both roles during mating. It's usually after mating that they kind of have more sexual warfare going on. Thank you. Brilliant, fascinating. Okay, David, we've got no hands up. Have we got, yeah. we've got some questions from the chat? Yeah, there's, there's, I'll, I'll, I'll try and lump some of these together because there's, there's quite a few. There's a bundle of questions about the, the Spanish slug, Arian vulgaris. Um, what what yes. can we say about it interbreeding with other species? Um, Tristan asks, why is there such a big cluster in, of these records in Devon? And Mick would be just to know how widespread it is in, in the London area. So there we go. Oh, great questions. So this is where it gets really, really messy with taxonomy because Arian vulgaris <sighs> is that widespread invasive species from Europe, major pests, of course, but it can also hybridize with our native species that look incredibly similar. And they also have similar characters as well. So actually reliably identifying them to species can be quite challenging. Um, so generally more of the records were from the south of the country because that's where it first established itself. Um, but it has also got to other locations throughout the country, probably through things like the plant trade or people moving goods between different areas of the UK as well. Um, so actually identifying them is quite challenging. So although the ID guide does talk about how the sole of the foot is really dark and the rim of the breathing pool is really dark as well, actually that character does crop up, crop up in some populations of our native species as well. Um, so you kind of have to resort to dissection in a lot of cases to actually know for sure whether it's present or not. Um, so I'm afraid for that reason, I don't know exactly how well established it is in London, but it probably is present and it probably is hybridizing with our native species. Thanks. Um, let me see, I've got a few more here from people. Um, there's a few questions about, um, I guess, their, their structure and things. So Dun Duncan asks, uh, how do they breathe? Is it through the mucus? And Rebecca asks, do, do slugs have anything resembling a heart or a brain and anything resembling a nervous system? Great questions. Yes, so slugs actually breathe through that breathing pore, which is the big hole on the right hand side of the body. They can open and close that. So sometimes it's really hard to spot because it's closed. Other times it's really easy to see because it's wide open. Um, so that's how they actually breathe. And that leads directly into the lung. So there's a lung inside that cavity of the body um, and that actually takes all the oxygen out of the air, of course, for them. Um, the lymph system inside a slug is really simple. Um, it tends to be a case of more the blood kind of sloshing around in the body rather than being in neat veins like it is in our body. Um, but they do have a heart, which is usually tucked away in the mantle area, which will help pump that blood around the body space. Um, they also do have a rudimentary brain known as the ganglion, which is more like a circle of nerves rather than a more complex brain like humans do. And this is actually interestingly around its throat as a circle. So actually usually the, the gullet or the throat of the slug actually passes through its brain as well. Um, I'm not entirely sure why that is the case, but perhaps it's to make sure that they can't eat anything too big. That would be my immediate theory. <laughs> I think we've got time for two more questions. So if anybody has a burning question and wants to jump the queue, I'll allow it. If you raise your virtual hand, your little blue hand, you can skip the queue. I'm going to let David pick one last queue, one last question from the, the chat. And then if nobody puts their hand up, you can ask two. But yeah, if you want to, if you've got a burning question, raise your hand. 
So, David, what's our last, okay. potentially last I, question from the chat? I, listen, I, I, I will sneakily use Vicky Harley's three related questions because they are related. Um, it was all about the, the, the interbreeding species that you talked about. Um, if the different species mate, do they produce fertile offspring? If so, do the offspring then prefer, prefer to mate with a, well, which parent species would they breed with? And if they are interfertile like that, are they really different species? So there we go. It's really great questions. And there is a whole PhD in that. And in fact, there's so much research being done on this issue because there is so many complicated things happening with these. No. Um... Yeah, so, so it's really complicated what is happening with this group. They've done a lot of studies on these um, and it's all kind of in the beginning stages to actually fully understand how much they hybridise and how much their offspring can then hybridise with each other or with other species. Um, it is thought that they probably are fertile, the hybrids, um, but it's probably a case of some genetics being more dominant in some species than others. So for example, like the green cellar slug and the yellow cellar slug, um, it might be the same case in the Arionidae. But again, like I said, there's, there's a whole PhD to be done in this and trying to understand this really complicated taxonomic mess that is with, happening with these big slugs. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Imogen. Right. Janet has, has jumped the queue with her hand up. Hi, Janet. Hi. You, hi. Get, you get to end it on a high, so this better be a great question. Oh, hi. No, it's just one. Um, I want to know how the slugs and the snails plant their gardens, because I notice on the walls around the house, uh, which I must say is in North Wales, is um, they plant gardens and go up and eat them. And, and I'd, I'd like to know how they do it. OK, so... One of the interesting things about slugs as well is that they, the slime can actually naturally disperse seeds. So they can easily get seeds stuck to them and then accidentally transfer them somewhere else. Um, so that might be what you're seeing is basically the seeds being moved around by the slugs and put there by accident. Um, but also some plants have developed really interesting strategies for this as well. So some plants, um, when the slug feeds on the seed, often they'll eat the seed whole or they scrape the coating of the seed off as they're eating it and as they digest it that coating gets broken down as well and some research has shown that certain plants and certain slugs have kind of developed this relationship where those seeds will actually then be pooped out by the slug somewhere else and because of that coating being scraped off the seed they'll actually germinate a lot better than other plants that have not had that coating scraped off by a slug so there's a really interesting relationship between plants and slugs as well that we're just starting to understand too. Right. Now I was thinking more of, of like um, lichens and moss areas that they seem to go and, and tend, if you like. Oh yes, yeah. So a lot of species again will feed on things like that as well. Um, so I'm not really sure how much they are aware of gardening or particularly grazing particular areas to a certain amount, um, but they do often kind of have areas that they prefer. So things like the cellar slugs tend to be a little bit more territorial in a way in that they will tend to stick to the same grazing zones or grazing areas each, each time they go. Um, however, there, sometimes there'll be kind of big events where suddenly this will all shift. So another naturalist who's really into slugs has talked about this to me before where he's been observing a colony of these slugs on a wall and the same individuals would always go to the same spots all the time for many weeks. And then one night there was big torrential rain and something happened and all the slugs moved around and some crossed the road and went to different walls. And it was just like some big event had kind of changed their behavior. So it's really complicated slug behavior and something we're only just kind of understanding as well. Okay, thanks. <laughs> right, so I just want to say an absolutely huge thank you to Imogen for what's been an absolutely fascinating, fascinating talk. And there's already people asking for you to come back to LNHS and talk again. But if you do, I think you're, you're going to have to take the unloved out of the title because I think you've won over the 156 people. That <laughs> so yeah, next time it'll just have to be sticky and slimy, I'm afraid, rather than, than in love. Um, so yeah, so 